This is why Small Business Matters from Northumbria University. Supporting small businesses with the Help to Grow Management Programme. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Why Small Business Matters. My name is Matt Sutherland and I'm part of a team at Northumbria University who spent the last decade working with over 400 SMEs. Listening to their experiences, helping them overcome their challenges and celebrating their successes. This podcast is an extension to this activity and provides SMEs and entrepreneurs the chance to share their stories and what it means to be a successful SME in 2022. Today, I'm joined by Lucy Winskill, Pro Vice Chancellor at Northumbria University. Lucy's focus is on employability and strategic partnerships, where since 2010, she's played a key role in the development of the university's relationships with local government, business and championing business startups. Prior to joining Northumbria, Lucy was a litigation lawyer of 28 years and has extensive non-executive director experience. She's currently the chair of the Northeast Local Enterprise Partnership, having been the chair of the Northeast Chamber of Commerce. It goes without saying that this type of work doesn't go unnoticed, and in 2014, Lucy received an OBE for services to higher education and the regional economy. You could argue, what could she possibly do next? But last month it was announced that Lucy in the summer will take up the new role of Lord Lieutenant of Tyne and Weir. But my guests don't stop there, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Emma Godden. Emma has a breadth of business experience, having established EMG Solicitors in 2014, one of the leading law firms with offices in the Northeast and Northwest. Welcome to you both. The first thing I would love to know is how did the two of you first meet? So at the time, I was chair of the board of the Northeast Chamber of Commerce, and I was working closely with the then chief executive, James Ramsbottom, just to um, bring in some some new faces and some new voices and some new ways of thinking onto that board. Uh, And the board is really um, like any non-executive board. It's looking after the running of the chamber as a business. And it was James Ramsbottom who introduced me to Emma, And she was a great addition to the team. Um, We had good female representation on the board, but there was always room for more. And we were particularly interested in Emma's entrepreneurial spirit and the fact that she'd set up her own business. And who doesn't want a female lawyer on her board, said said a former female lawyer. They always bring value, or so we tell ourselves. So that's how I met Emma, and I worked with her on the board um, I obviously stood down from that role uh, a little while ago. We'll hear in a minute whether she's still involved in that. But that's how we met. And she was a woman that I admired and have wanted to keep in touch with. Thank you, Lucy. Yes, that is right. So I and I knew your name because um, obviously the Winskill family are well known as lawyers in the northeast. So and I have worked with a family member of yours. Um, so but yes, that's how we actually got to meet was when I came along to the board. And I think you and I were probably on the board together for about 18 months or two years, something like that. It was Yes, it wasn't it wasn't too long. Mm, it was it was pre pandemic, which is how I tend to judge most things as to whether they happen yes. before COVID or not. Um, and um, and then, of course, we had your send off by Zoom, didn't we? Yes, that was very strange. I was on a Zoom call. Um, being sent off and, and there the company secretary I'm looking out the window is walking up my drive with a large bunch of flowers to present to me on Zoom so it was very well choreographed. <laughs> and what type of activity did you get up to when you were just working together on the Northeast Chamber of Commerce board? Was, what, what were you involved in? Just I mean it was finite but what type of activity did you do together? I think some of the key things we looked at were obviously reviewing the membership always and, and is the offer fit for purpose because it's a it's a very large chamber of commerce and it has a number of very different businesses to look at. So we probably um, together, Emma, with the board, looked at the, the membership packages uh, and whether they were still for, fit for purpose. Like any good non-exec board, we would have approved the budget together uh, we would have looked at staffing and resources and, you know, all, all the sensible things that a, the that a board should do. I think, Emma, you joined us after the momentous time when we decided to um, sell off the training business. I think that was done before you joined us. And that, that took a huge amount of time. And the other thing we looked at very closely was making sure that we were prepared for Brexit and what was the level of support that we could, as a chamber, 
give to northeast businesses because so many of the chamber members are exporters yes and and then of course the big thing that we had to tackle because i didn't join the board mountains of time before covid hit was actually how could we support our members through covid so there was a whole covid package that we put into place in terms of membership cost and so on so we uh, we were working together a little bit on that as well weren't we well john mccabe actually joined us on episode five of this podcast um in his new role of um ceo of the chamber talking about that support that the chamber's providing for businesses um and i know with lucy and i with our university hat on we have five great universities that provide an awful lot of talent to those businesses uh the northeast therefore is fertile ground to do business what what makes the northeast with that support and those universities extra special to do business i think all of the universities are very focused on the community um, and the northeast and making sure that our Graduates will stay in the Northeast and hopefully um, help current businesses grow in the Northeast, or that our graduates will start their own businesses. And if we do lose them away from the Northeast, very often we like to get them back. Um, and there's no harm in losing people and coming back with some fresh thinking as long as we continue to grow that, that talent pool. And I think all of the universities have very different offers. Um, so obviously I would, I would say that um, our business clinic which you might be very familiar with, and the, and the level of pro bono support that it provides for it provides for northeast businesses are very important. But similarly for our students, what we call the incubator hub, allowing students of any discipline, not necessarily a business student, could be a life scientist, could be a historian, could be a digital expert, could be a gaming expert, giving them the opportunities to um, be supported in setting up their own businesses. But I think, Matt, that the work that you and colleagues do in the business school is particularly important, and that is about that scaling up um, and developing yet greater strengths in Northeast businesses. And that's something that I um, have admired greatly from um, where I sit in the university, looking at your colleagues in the business school. Yeah, and, and I think for me as an employer, um, you know, what we've seen the universities offer is people with real practical skills as well. You know, law is such an academic field. And whilst it's wonderful to have people who are technically very proficient and academic, you know, in the law and great legal brains, you've got to temper that with people who can talk to clients and can offer advice to clients in a format that clients can understand it and receive it and work with it. And, and what we found is that the um, because over the last uh, 12 to 18 months in particular, we've really had a focus on taking on trainees and, um, you know, kind of recruiting the next generation. We felt that we're of a size that we're able to do that. So what we found as we've been interviewing people is, first of all, the huge amount of um, uh, of technical legal ability they've got, but that they do have, an, you know, we are looking for people who will come along, interact with people, hold conversations, you know, be kind of bright and interesting um, and work in a way that clients need them to. And we found that, you know, that's great. And, and also that actually the number of like bright and interesting people who just have so much to offer in terms of being really free with their thinking and free with their opinions, you know, they're not afraid to tell you, um, kind of what they think about things and that's a bit like oh I probably would never have dreamt of saying that if I'd been in an interview you know 25 years ago but these days they'll absolutely tell you how it is and, I, and actually what's been really good for me when we've been interviewing when we did our we were down to our final round at the end of last year and we spoke to people about you know kind of why do you want to come and work for us and the interest that they had was a lot of it was geared around well I love the community stuff that you're doing and you know we're really interested in in that side of things so it, it wasn't necessarily about well you know I'm you know I want to be somewhere where I get the most pay or I want to be somewhere you know where I get the, the most in-depth challenging legal technical work there their interest was in all sorts of things you know and in, in in how we interact with our community which is brilliant for us. I, I couldn't agree with uh, that more Emma that that idea that this the students' values are very important to them and they do make long and considered and careful choices about the sorts of firms or organisations that, that they want to be involved with. Um, and, and it's very refreshing. And I think, again, if I look at the, the law and the business students um, at Northumbria University and the areas of expertise we have in, in research around responsible business, bringing our students in at that very early stage to think exactly that, what kind of businesses do I want to work in or what kind of business do I create? What is the ethos? What is the culture? It's really interesting to see. 
they're not chasing the money and nor are they i always say this nor are they the snowflakes that we um we hear about in some of the newspapers that they're, they're tough resilient focused young people and we've really seen the best of that resilience in the last two years when they haven't really had the dream um, time that they signed up to all those years ago when initially they applied to be a student. But the work they've done with the university supporting uh, communities during pandemic, lockdown and so on was remarkable. Yeah, and I think it's, it's really nice to hear that um, from an employer perspective, and I'm looking at Emma, that um, that actually what makes a great prospective employee isn't just the technical expertise it's the soft skills it's the ability to do business with people and to listen and to communicate and, and maybe some of the gaps in the technical skill actually could be backfilled over time but having somebody who can come into a business culturally f- fit into the business and add value is a really attractive proposition and you're right we've got five universities in the northeast that are giving us access to a lovely pool of talent of um, of graduates who can come hopefully come in and contribute to businesses uh, like yours. Now, I'm really interested, Emma, in your story as well about EMG solicitors, because this is something that you established in 2014. First of all, can you just tell me what, who are EMG solicitors? Oh, sure. That's um, that's a, a big question, um, who we are and who we want to be. So uh, we, you're right, we were established in 2014. Um, I'm not from the Northeast, as you can probably tell from the accent. So I moved up here in 2010 to be with my partner, who is from the Northeast. Um, and I moved here from Manchester to be with him. I worked at a different firm and then just really felt that I wanted to kind of you know, do things my own way, I suppose. And so myself and a colleague, um, Gemma, who were had been working with me in, in the other firm, you know, we got together to create the firm and it was very much a joint endeavour. And um, what we wanted to create originally was, you know, we were a little practice, we were four people and we didn't. Gemma might disagree with me, but I don't think we had any huge ambitions. We knew we wanted to, to kind of keep growing, but we hadn't really given any thought as to what that might look like. And then um, we just found that um, kind of, I don't know, you know, hard work brought success. And so we felt that, well, actually, we're able to refer this kind of work and do this kind of work. So let's take on somebody who can do that. Um it was Will's work and it was family work. And so we could create that. And and actually what we found was that the people we were taking on and the people that we were attractive to was often working mums. Um, and the reason for that was because um, I was a working mum myself. Um, so when we set the firm up, you know, when the firm opened for business, I had two children under the age of two. I had a four month old baby and a 23 month old daughter. So right from the get go, we knew we had to be a firm that would work for working parents. And so we were paperless from the start. Um, we worked on laptops, not, um, you know, not kind of tower computers so that actually you could just take your laptop home. And it isn't about saying, oh, well, that means that you can work day and night from 5 a.m. until, you know, 11 p.m. But it is about saying that actually, if it suits you, as it often suits me still, to get up early, do a couple of hours before the family wakes up um, and then, you know, spend some time with my family and walk my dogs and then actually kind of start, you know, start work again at nine or half nine or whatever it might be, that you can do that. And we just wanted to create create an environment in which whenever people wanted to work because it fitted their lifestyle as long as the clients are happy and that's really important because it's the clients that pay the bills um then actually you should be able to do that that you know that was what we wanted to to create an environment in which that could happen and what that meant was that actually we had a lot of working mums in particular that wanted to come and do that as uh, you know as their kind of career progressed and they had children and actually what always seemed very strange to me was that um great commercial firms would give women amazing technical training, um, you know, train them up really well as lawyers, train them in all of those business skills that we need, you know, time recording and understanding finances and, you know, chargeable time and billing and all that kind of thing. Give them all of these skills and then they would want to perhaps have a family and then they'd almost kind of get thrown on the scrap heap and be told, oh, well, you can't have a career then. And it's like, but you've just invested, you know, eight or ten years in them and actually all you need to do is just give them a bit of time and a bit of flexibility and they'll repay that in spades and and that was what we decided to do. And was that flexibility the trigger point for you and Gemma to to maybe have that conversation and back in 2013, 14 to to make the move and go on your own? Was it was it that flexibility that I think was the um the driver for moving on and starting your own firm? 
Yes, I think it was definitely a, a big part of it. So, so Gemma originally came in to cover me because I was going on maternity leave with baby number one. So therefore, you know, family was very much uppermost in my mind when when she joined the firm that I was at. Um, and so then I knew I wanted some flexibility in terms of kind of what, you know, when I went back and what that would what what that would look like. And then so actually when I handed my notice in, because I was on a six month notice period, by then I was seven months pregnant with baby number two. So again, we knew that setting the firm up would um, would have to be very kind of, um, you know, very flexible as to how we achieved that. And we knew that Gemma wanted a family. So we knew that that would have to fall into place for her as well. So that that was all the key part of it. And I think as well, sometimes you just get to a point where you think, like I said before, I want to do things my own way now. And I've got a real vision as to, as to you know, how I would like to conduct myself in business. And I think the only way I can do that is probably by kind of taking charge and uh, and so that I can do things in exactly the way I want to. Maybe it's the control freak in me. What support was available in the region to help steer and guide your new business? Was there support from the local authority? Was there um, support from um, entrepreneurial groups and societies? Where, where did you look for that support to help guide you in, in the infancy of your business? So right at the beginning, I didn't seek out any of that. Um, right at the beginning, I we were just kind of concerned with getting ourselves up and running. And then after um, a couple of years, I'd met a few people who were in Vistage. Um, and um, so that was introduced to me as actually, you know, kind of if you want to think about growth, then perhaps you need to go and, you know, see how other people are doing it. So first of all, I went to Vistage um, and I was uh, there at the beginning of a new group um, that uh, Harry Marsland was creating. Um, and it was a look, it was uh, me and about, I don't know, about six or eight blokes at the very beginning. And there was such a nice group of guys. And Harry set up this lovely group where it was really friendly. And, you know, one of the purposes behind Vistage is it's very much um, the discussions that you have, you know, it's all kept in the room and... So I'd never really been in that environment before and we were able to just have very open and frank conversations about what we wanted to do. And then um, from there, someone mentioned to me about the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses course. And so I was really interested in that because that was going to be obviously a, a much more kind of concentrated version, you know, and, and a lot of learning in a short space of time. Um, so I applied for that. Um didn't really realise I'd have to be interviewed and things. And so that was all a bit nerve wracking. And then I got onto that course and that was a, a really good springboard for me into um, opening our second office um, and the expansion that came around that. And then so I, I finished the 10,000 Small Businesses course and kind of just delved back into my own business, putting all of that into practice and trying to make us more commercial and so on. And then I... Um, after 10,000 small businesses, there came, um, I did some mentoring. So I got myself some one-to-one -one mentoring with someone who sat down with me, Lucy, who was lovely. And that kind of gave me a different, you know, a different kind of focus again. Um, but actually, I quite enjoy that group environment where you listen to other people and see what, what other people are up to and so on. And so then the um, Entrepreneurs Forum run a scale-up program. Um, so I went and did that and it was kind of that that perhaps shaped me around opening up our um next office which we're about to open an office in Penrith so so each each um uh, way that we've chosen you know that I've chosen to get mentoring or go on a course or whatever has kind of shaped the next stage of growth in the business and the next thing I've chosen to so every time you had an intervention there was some kind of impact output from from that decision yes absolutely yeah, yeah. and Great a lot way. of the work that Lucy and I do at, at the university with our broader team here is about trying to support SMEs and get them onto business growth programs. What would be the biggest, um, what, what do you think would be one of the biggest things that you sort of, the biggest takeaways you took from the Goldman Sachs 10,000 SME program, you know, that you think, actually, I didn't know that at all before I did this. And I needed that to know that to, for, for establishing my and running my business. I think um, that's a good question. Uh, to me, a lot of these things, you do learn things, obviously, whilst you're on them. And there was a great thing about, you know, like creating your business model canvas. Like I didn't know any phrases like this and I hadn't read any books and I haven't really read many more books now. Um, 
but so so all those kind of ideas you know that idea of you know what are people's pain points and what is it that you're seeking to relieve like what purpose does your business really have understanding that because then it puts you into the mind of your customer and actually you know what is it that you're trying to do for people what's your offering to them so that was all something that I um hadn't ever thought about and 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 thinking a lot because a lot of people on the course obviously there's a whole variety of uh, different types of business but a lot of them are manufacturing related which on one part you'd think well we're a service industry as lawyers so how does that fit but on the other part you can you can think of yourself like a manufacturing plant and actually you know kind of how does our productivity work and you know I, I do sometimes describe us as a bit of a sausage factory to our to my colleagues in terms of you know what you put in the machine at the beginning will directly translate into what comes out at the end and if you don't put it in then it won't come out so you know they're all related these things but the most important thing I think from doing something like that that I found is that it's it's doing that thing of taking you out of working directly in your business you know just I need to have the next client meeting I need to you know to win the next piece of work or whatever it might be and just making you think about your your business as a bigger picture um and taking that time out and sometimes I'll find that things just come to me and I'm supposed to be listening and doing something completely different in a session that I'm at and actually it just you know kind of a light bulb comes on and you're making notes or you're hearing somebody else's experience but it, it is definitely it enforces upon you that time to take to take time out and think about your business as a whole because actually you know even now I go well actually I'm going to take these days out or whatever and it never quite happens I'm probably not disciplined enough but actually what happens is a piece of client work comes along and you go I must do that instead fantastic yeah and I'm looking at Lucy because I'm looking at Lucy with a chair of a northeast lep hat on a local enterprise partnership and a lot of the conversations coming out of the Northeast Lab. I'm thinking of Colin Bell as the business and sector growth director and of course of Lucy and colleagues has been around creating better jobs in the Northeast and support and one of the things that I see coming out in absolute um, out of all the pores of EMG solicitors is around the support that you you offer support of course to your clients because they pay the bills but the support that you're giving to your colleagues and that that's a that's fantastic can you tell us a little bit more about some of the the steps now you've got in place in the whole business to support colleagues around flexible working and how they fulfill their day job uh, sure so we um the, the ethos of our firm has always tried to be um as we touched upon a few minutes ago that actually as long as the clients are happy and as long as the work's being done i don't really mind when it's done or where it's done um you know that's 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 fine by me um that but that's got to be the most important thing so so flexibility is a really big part and then we try and um uh, we try and create work in a nice environment and actually that's why i find you know this all that covid has led to and hybrid working i'm not convinced that actually people will permanently have this you know everybody's kind of of the mind well everybody's going to be working at home all the time because I think that people are inherently social animals and actually a lot of us like being in an office together quite a lot of the time and building relationships so you know we like to try and build relationships we've we've restructured our review process so that it's also based around our values so that actually we try and make sure that people are living the values of the firm and we we give them feedback on that um And actually, one of the big things that we're starting next Monday is we're introducing an electric car scheme, which will enable our people to get electric vehicles a bit more cost efficiently, which right now is um, is quite attractive to lots of people who are paying a fortune for fuel. I'm seeing Lucy nodding. And of course, Lucy was a litigation lawyer for nearly was it 28 years. So this is you're you familiar with a lot of this, uh, these conversations here about relationships and looking after and supporting colleagues. Um, it, it's the thing that makes it the valuable job that it is being a lawyer. It's, it's a real privilege to be a lawyer and and you work with some fantastically clever people um, and you work with some amazingly um, interesting clients as well. Um, that said, I love my 28 years as a lawyer, but I was ready to move on. And um, when I, I was smiling to myself earlier when Emma was talking about this idea that she had a laptop and could work anywhere, that was not the sort of firm that I left. You were absolutely glued to the uh, computer at the office and there were very fixed hours. And um, that that flexibility wasn't there then. But I, I'm 12 years out of that now. So I'd like to think the world has changed a little for the better. 
Do you know what, Lucy? No, I'm not sure it has that much, and I think there is within the law. There's still a huge culture of presenteeism that we really need to move away from. You know, you're not going to get promoted if you're not there at seven o'clock at night, like that. You know, that yeah. that just needs to end. Uh, well, actually, and that's where I'm quite interested in talking about your community fund because looking from the outside in of EMG solicitors, you've got a great business with support, as we've mentioned, at the heart of both your clients and your colleagues. But you've also pushed further and you've looked at how you can support the broader community. Can you say a little bit more about your community fund? I suppose we started off in our uh, kind of charitable initiatives by linking quite closely in with Headway, which is a brain injury charity. Um, And of course, because about half of the work that we do as a firm is working with people who have a brain injury. So that felt very close to our hearts. And that was why we set up um, uh, the what's called the Wonderland Ball, which supports uh, Headways Look Ahead in the North, Weekend Away. Um, and so we started doing that. And to be honest, that was a bit of selfishness on my part because um, that was because in Manchester, there's a really great ball called the Cornflower Ball, which has just happened this year. And it's run by the Spinal Injuries Association. And I came to the Northeast and there wasn't a really great ball around that um, that I could go and have a really good night out at. So that's how the Wonderland Ball was born. Um, so that, that was kind of the beginnings of our charity work. But and although Headway is, you know, a, a, an organisation that's very close to our hearts, what we wanted to have something was that really linked into our community and the people around us, because essentially a lot of those are the people who pay the bills because they're our clients. So, you know, it's important to to give back to where you are and to become fully integrated into your community. Um, and I'd known the County Durham Community Foundation for a long time, all the time I was in the Northeast. But then when we set up EMG, um, uh, we were approached um, by Michelle Cooper a, a few years into it um, to say, you know, kind of would we be ready to set a fund up and would we think about it? So we set the fund up in uh, 2019 using the 2018, 2019 profits. And originally for the first two years, we've just been a grant making fund. So in other words, the money that goes in seeks to come straight out again. Um However, we are just about to convert over to become an endowment fund, which means that of our money that goes in, um, part of it will come out. But obviously, essentially, what we're trying to do is create a savings pot for the future. And um, so that's that's our kind of next stage. And that feels really exciting to me because that, to me, is an opportunity to create a lasting legacy for the future and actually leave something that will have a positive impact in the northeast long after I've stopped being around. And so I did manage to I did dare to say a couple of weeks ago, kind of out loud and in public that my goal for the fund um, is for it to be worth a million pounds, an endowment fund. Now, that will take some time. Our commitment is to give 5% of our profits to charity. And unfortunately, our profits are not such that 5% will get us to a million pounds anytime soon. But it is a really great goal for me. Um, A, because it will give something lovely back um, and it will create a a long lasting um, kind of legacy, which I would really like to do. Um, but, But secondly, because actually... Because we've committed to giving 5% of our profits to charity, inherently, if we manage to create a fund like that, that's that will be because we're being a profitable and successful business. And and actually, that means that, you know, we should be a business that pays our employees well. And, you know, by being profitable, it means that we can look after our staff. It means that we've been successful in terms of looking after our clients. So it there will be a lot of lovely things that will have to happen in order to create that endowment fund. So, you know, I'll be, I'll be really pleased if we can get there. You're listening to Why Small Business Matters. Find out how Northumbria University can help your business thrive through the Help to Grow Management Programme, delivered by leading small business and enterprise experts from Northumbria University with the support of leading figures from industry and experienced entrepreneurs. The programme supports senior managers of small and medium-sized businesses to boost their business's performance, resilience and long-term growth. The 12-week programme is 90% funded by the government and the fee payable by participants is £750 and has been designed to allow participants to complete it alongside full-time work. The in-depth, high-quality curriculum supports you to build your capabilities in leadership, innovation, digital adoption, employee engagement, marketing, responsible business and financial financial management. By the end of the program, you'll develop a business growth plan to help you lead your business to realize its potential. To find out more about the program, the modules, eligibility and fees and delivery dates, go to northumbria.ac.uk/helptogrow. 
You're listening to Why Small Business Matters. My name's Matt Sutherland, and today I'm joined by Lucy Winskill and Emma Godden. I'm looking at Lucy, actually, because with your chair of the, the North East LEP, you must be enjoying listening to this. There must be a lot of things that you're campaigning for and trying to support with business. I don't know where to start because Emma has said so many things that are just sparking ideas, but but the, the jobs, the, the good quality jobs is perhaps where I'll start. Um, and I inherited the mantra that was created when the um, the Local Enterprise Partnership Strategic Economic Plan was created 10 or 11 years ago, about 100,000 more and better jobs. And sometimes uh, the chief exec and I look at each other and think that better jobs is probably misunderstood because it is very easy to think that means better paid jobs. But it isn't only about creating more and better paid jobs in the northeast. It's about creating better jobs in terms of decent contracts, decent working hours, um, fair working practices and so on. And I think that's that's a key element of the kind of jobs that the northeast LEP is, is trying to support. We were really um, going great guns against that target until COVID-19 hit. So we've, we're just now beginning to just claw back from where we had a sort of pause um, at the start of lockdown. We're recording this two years to the day when we first went into lockdown, which is pretty frightening when you think about it. Um, but we will claw back and we are we are showing some signs of um, getting back on track for that target. And all of the other targets that we have around... Um, business startups and about attracting inward investment and about um, innovation and all the skills piece, which people tend to forget about a little in the work of, of the let, but the skills work uh, is very important as well. And then I'm going to just jump, because I was so excited by what Emma was saying, just listening to her about the talk about the fund that she set up at the uh, Durham Community Foundation, because I'm a trustee of the Tyne and Weir Community Foundation. I, um, I have a tiny little fund there myself, and I was persuaded to set up what was then a small acorn called an acorn fund from which oaks may grow. Um, I don't know if I'll get to a million unless my premium bonds come up, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but I was really encouraged because um, a, a delightful man that none of us ever had heard of called Mr. Murray, who um, didn't have any family, left a very large sum of money to the Community Foundation in Tyne and Weir. But he said, I want this money to be used to match other people. So the equivalent of me putting in Tuppence Hapney became twice times Tuppence Hapney to grow that fund. And it's given me um, a lot of satisfaction setting the fund up, making small distri distributions every year. Um, and I'm really interested to hear from Emma how how she and her colleagues will determine how the distribution in her fund will be made. I, you know, it's easy when it's me. Uh, I might sit at the kitchen table and have a cup of coffee with my husband and say, I think I'm doing this. For this fund, and if I drop down dead, can you make sure it all is sorted out for me, please? These are the things that are important to me. But I'd love to know, Emma, how you, how you make that decision with all the different interests, with all the different people in your firm. Yeah. So we what we decided to do is so we set up a committee, and there's about five of us sit on the committee, and we rotate that every couple of years because it kind of takes you a couple of years to get your teeth into it and 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 see how it works um and um we said that we would have three priorities which is to support young people um and to support the elderly and to support women um and applicants don't have to fall into one of those three categories but but largely that's what they're encouraged to do and so we've done some really nice bits and pieces um, just before COVID hit, we did a refurbishment of a football um, club, like, you know, a youth football um, uh, club. And um, and so refurbished their changing rooms and a couple of my colleagues went down to see what all that looked like. And it was just great to see the enthusiasm and the impact it had had. Then we did some some general, the County Drunk Community Foundation, as they all were, I'm sure, was doing some COVID bits and pieces, you know, kind of. And so we we put some money into there. Um, we've done some stuff to employ some youth workers um, in terms of kind of helping, you know, people hanging around Durham and young uns hanging around Durham. Um, and then more recently, um, which has been lovely, um, we've supported a stick makers association in Durham, which is something for elderly gentlemen who get together and carve wood. Um, and uh, and that's, you know, kind of aiming to combat loneliness and give purpose and so on. And so a couple of my colleagues went up to see them about a month ago and were given the most beautiful hand carved shepherd's crook. Um, and, um, 
my son needed a stick for school and I went to ask if he could take it in and I was told very firmly not because the likelihood of it returning in one piece from it going into school was quite low. Um, but so in our Penrith office, um, our uh, head of business development has an idea that what we're going to do is we're going to have a moss wall on the wall. She wants it to be all kind of quite agricultural and so on. And um, if you've ever been to either of our offices, you'll know that we have... Um, two animals from the St Oswald's Trail. We've got a Spocky dog um, in our Durham office and we've got an Elmer the Elephant in our Gosforth office. And she's trying to find someone who we can do some kind of sheep with. And then she wants the moss wall and the sheep next to it and the shepherd's crook. And she's feeling like the whole thing will fit together really very nicely. I walk past your window in Gosforth every day when I go down to get my newspaper and back, which is my fresh air before I start the day. Uh, and I'm always pleased to see um, it's just such an unconventional looking law firm when you see uh, Emma and all of her colleagues in the photographs with the elephant. It's amazing. But it's amazing to listen to you to think about not just the impact that's coming out of this business. It, it, you're simply not thinking of profit. You're thinking that, OK, there has to be economic impact, but there's a social good and it's holistic. It's for clients, it's for your colleagues and it's for the broader community who aren't necessarily having a day-to-day -day relationship with the MG solicitors. So huge impact and, 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 and exceedingly inspiring to listen to. So... Um, which is which is absolutely fantastic. I'm thinking about the next steps. I'm thinking about how how government can help support the northeast and businesses like yours. I'm thinking about leveling up. And I'm thinking is it is it do we like what we're seeing Lucy so far? We know that leveling up is all around better lives and boosting business productivity. But do we like what we've seen so far in the government white paper? The trick will be how the government will allocate funds in the future. Uh, and we know in the levelling up white paper, there is a real drive that more money will flow if there are larger devolution deals. And so um, you, you can't unravel the aspiration of government about levelling up and money that will flow without solving the problem of our rather complex um, structures at the moment with um, a let that works at the moment with the, the, the elected mayor and his combined mayor of authority a different combined authority for the four uh, local authorities who didn't sign up to that deal a little while ago. The added interest of County Durham declaring um, a, a county deal and how all of that will work out makes it a fascinating place to be chair of the board, just working with everybody, um, some wanting to come to the table sooner than others, but um, a business community in the northeast who is saying we're really not very interested in the politics. Please, can we have a bigger devolution deal? So the decision making about money and where it goes in the northeast is made by us because we understand our strengths in the region and we can shout the loudest about them and attract um, the right sort of businesses to invest here and the right sort of businesses to grow. So I actually, it's um, it's a really interesting time to be involved in this fascinating world of. Um, Small p politics. Ask me, ask me back, Matt. Matt in um, in six months' time, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see where we are. I was going to say, you won't be on a Northumbria employment contract there. and Maybe we could have a very free and honest conversation. And actually, that leads me to, of course, to congratulate Lucy, who will be leaving the university very sadly on our behalf in the summer after 12 sterling years at the university. And you're taking on a new role and you're going to be the Lord Lieutenant of Tyne and Weir. The next Lord Lieutenant of Tyne and Weir, which is a role that many people um, won't understand and won't have heard of, and I wouldn't criticise them for that at all. So the monarch um, has a representative in every county, and um, that that individual really acts as the ears and eyes of the monarch. And I have been, after a consultation within the region, uh, have been asked by Her Majesty if I will take on that role. And she's not the sort of woman you say no to. And she's probably not the sort of person that you think, actually, the timing's not right because I love my day job. But can you ask me again in 10 years time? Um, and I am, of course, very, very keen to work and serve her. Um, and I think, you know, my, my tenure could be a number of years. Technically, Lord Lieutenants, once they're appointed, stay in place until they're 75. And Matt, I'll just reassure you that obviously that's a very long time away um, whether I last all those uh, years, I don't know, but certainly um, the, the, the individual in the cabinet office who led the consultation said, if we can get 10 good years out of you, that would be good. Um, and I really, you know, accept with sadness that probably I will see 
the death of this monarch and the coronation of the of the next, which would be sad. But the real rolling up of the sleeves um, of that job involves supporting the um, communities within Tyne and Weir. And that could be the voluntary sector and the communities that they support. Um, I had a year as high sheriff for just one year. And that was fascinating working. I thought I knew my patch really well, but but working um, with some very challenging communities, young people in the region was quite an eye opener. Uh, but it also involves supporting businesses. So I'll oversee the Queen's Award for Enterprise, the Queen's Award for Voluntary Services. I'll be looking out to make sure that the very best individuals in the Northeast are celebrated uh, and successful in the Honours Awards, that the right people um, get the right attention from the royal family. I'll be fighting off all the other Lord Lieutenants up and down who will want royal visits. And with a smaller royal family, that, that that's going to be harder to come by. So um, as you know, Matt, it was very long ago that we had the Princess Royal at, uh, at Northumbria. And the students, we hadn't told them she was coming because of security reasons. The students were so full of excitement that that um, the Princess Royal had come to their university. So all my friends who say, ah, oh, you know, it's really, why do you want to be involved in that? If they are involved with any community group that ever has any interest or a royal patron, they'll understand why you want to support the work of the royal family. And I'll be waving my Union Jack at that lovely um, Platinum Jubilee celebrations in a couple of weeks' time. But I will, Matt, be devastated to leave Northumbria. It's been a privilege to work in a university as modern and as progressive and with such wonderful colleagues. So please could you invite me back to do lots of things with you? I think we absolutely do. And we wish you the absolute best. And I think from listening to you and Emma today that your paths will cross, actually. I think the work that EMG solicitors are doing and your new role and the community piece and the contribution and that holistic, well, that holistic contribution that you've both been talking about today, I think your paths will cross and you will, uh, you'll you be nominating Emma and Emma will be hosting, oh, <laughs> ho- <so>. hosting events. <laughs> And it's, well, it's been an absolute delight to, uh, to speak to you both. Thank you so much for your time. The title of the podcast is Why Small Business Matters. But individually, why do you think small business really matters? The Northeast uh, is made up of, of SMEs, small, medium enterprises. And, and we shouldn't think that the small definition um, is actually, it's not a micro business, small businesses. I think the definition is less than 50 employees and an annual turnover under a hundred thousand no 10 10 million euro we're still we're working in euro definitions for this um and the medium-sized businesses these are big significant businesses in the northeast so um and and this is the bedrock of the northeast economy these smes so they're incredibly important and the reason i paused is i was just thinking about you know that one of the largest businesses worldwide Based, if I looked out of my office window uh, here, I could see the headquarters of Sage Gateshead, uh, Sage uh, PLC. That was a micro business formed by four individuals having a pint in the local pub in Newcastle upon Tyne not very long ago, and you just see how that business has grown. Now, of course, it's the example that we that we always use because that growth has been incredible and it's such a modern um, international business. But there are others out there. And so it's it's vitally important that we really support every business we can in the Northeast to thrive. And all of our life chances around health, around education, everything will lift. If we have a really, really good, strong economy in the Northeast, everything will flow from that. And that's what the LEP is, is driving at every day and i think that small businesses matter because without small businesses big businesses don't exist you know big businesses are entirely reliant upon small business because they were one themselves at one point in time be it in the the recent past or the longer distant past they probably rely on them as customers um and and also small businesses you know they push boundaries and they challenge in a way that big business can't always because it is a it's a bigger ship to turn isn't it and and already you know with the size of business that we are so so we're now at about 80 people and um i wouldn't say that we're not flexible but it isn't as easy for us to pivot which i know is a dreadful word but it isn't easy as easy for us to pivot now as it was when there was five of us and so you know small businesses can can push and and be 
can be challenging and be tough and be um, demanding in a in a way that a big business can't always be. So, you know, that they're there pushing the boundaries. And if you look at some of the big businesses here, let's take again a well-known example of Nissan. Nissan is um, is successful up here because of that supply chain all around it and the small businesses that have clustered themselves around that. Uh, the other interesting model uh, that we'll look at with interest in the future will be British Volt. That, again, will be transformational for the supply chain around and about it in Blythe um, and and the, the wider bit of Northumberland. So uh, Emma's right. It's a relationship between the two and they're both dependent on one of their codependents. Thank you to my guests, Lucy Winskill and Emma Godden, for joining me today on Why Small Business Matters. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Don't forget to listen back to previous episodes focusing on networking with Ollie Barrett and Caroline Theobald and hearing about John McCabe's new role as Chief Executive of the Northeast Chamber of Commerce. Find out how Northumbria University can help your business through the Help to Grow Management Scheme from visiting northumbria.ac.uk slash help to grow.